On this episode of AV Week, will AV software save us all from the chip shortage, the importance of government compliance, and an M&A with a twist, all that and more, next on AV Week. The network for the AV industry. What are you listening to? This. This is AV. This. This. This is is AV AV Nation. Nation. This is AV Nation. This is AV Week, episode 578, recorded Friday, September 16th, 2022. AV, Church and State. Support for AV Nation is brought to you by Extron, industry leading technology backed by world class support. And by Biam, enabling extraordinary AV experiences for everyone. And by Daylight, the leading producer of high quality projection screens worldwide. This is AV Week, your weekly wrap-up of audiovisual news and information. My name is Tim Albright. I am your host with us to discuss the news and information we have gathered this week. First and foremost, we can't tell you where she works because we'd have to kill you. Dawn Mead. Welcome, ma'am. Thanks for having me as usual, Tim. Absolutely. Also with us is Ace producer, live event and um, virtual live event, Ace Johnson. Welcome, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Happy to be here. Uh, and last but not least, Mr. Derek Jon- Jonkus from uh, External Electronics. Welcome, sir. Thanks. Great to be here, Tim. And if you are not watching the video, all of us have uh, screen envy uh, from uh, Ace's video setup. You're only seeing two of about 23 screens he has surrounding him. So, yeah. It's my uh, mission command center. <laughs> I'm just saying, dude. That and you got, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you're, just, you're, you're, you're set up there. First story comes to us from our friends over at Commercial Integrator. Rico has acquired Scenero. Scenero with a C, C C-E-N-E-R-O. If you are familiar with Scenero, they are a audiovisual integrator. Um, Technically, they are headquartered in uh, Pennsylvania, but they've got um, uh, locations all around. Rico, uh, U.S., uh, is headquartered in Exton, Pennsylvania, but obviously Rico uh, is a multinational corporation. This is not the first integrator that Rico has purchased. Uh, I want to say about a year or two ago, Rico also uh, acquired Data Vision out of Germany. So this is this is kind of part and parcel of where Rico has been heading, uh, according to the Rico um, CEO and president of For North America. Quote unquote: This strategic investment in scenario in scenario will create new value for our customers, expanding our global integrated digital services portfolio with hybrid workspace solutions that enable secure, effective and collaborative meeting space meeting experiences for on premise on premises and remote employees alike. Ace, I'm going to start with you on this. Uh, like I said, this is not the first time that Rico has purchased an integrator, but it is quite interesting. Where do where do we sit as you know customers? Where do we sit as industry uh, veterans? Where do we sit as the industry with an, a manufacturer right purchasing an integrator? I, I think it's a little bit of a risky move. Could be a bold move, but um, it's kind of one you know. We'll see how they uh, how they try to manage the business and and separate church and state while servicing competitors and also you know owning their own company to do business in the industry. Um, you know, not sure why they decided to go this route strategically. Be real curious to uh, you know be a fly in that boardroom and understand what they think the. Uh, advantages are based on the size of the company they bought and market share and and product you know sold and things like that if they think they're going to do a a massive shift and overhaul with you know what they're selling and how they're selling it then you know there could be some advantages but you know i feel like that's a lot of customers that have to buy into a single product mindset that uh, there's a lot of options out there in the market that the rico competes against so um yeah it's, it's it's a curious move an interesting one like I say, bold and risky all at the uh, same time. Derek, uh, speaking of, of competitors in the marketplace, you are certainly one of them. Uh, w- when you look at it, not necessarily as an Extron employee, this is not you know Extron's company line. This is Derek as an in- industry uh, veteran. When you look at stuff like this, and, and, and the thing that makes integrators unique is the fact that they're able to bring disparate systems together and make them, not to be silly, integrated. So when you look at stuff like this, you know, what, what do you see as, as an industry veteran? Well, I think there must be some kind of shared opportunity that uh, both Rico and Scenario have identified that uh, 
make this must make sense for them. It seems to me, uh, based upon um, some of what Sonera has been promoting on their website and in the industry, that they've kind of taken a focus which seems very similar and aligned to what Rico has been uh, interested, at least to my knowledge, as of late. So there must be some uh, kind of like uh, we were just talking about there, that there must be some kind of synergies that they're hoping to achieve Um and I think this is just part of the larger trend of just kind of the acquisition, uh, I mean, the acquisition of other companies. You know, if, I think companies that can touch customers are those kinds of uh, investments that I think are pretty valuable. And um, you know, I I don't expect uh, this this to really change. I think we've seen other examples of this. So um, like you know, like Wallace was mentioning, I think we're going to. I think there's going to be interesting to see how this kind of plays out, um, at least for me. I'd be very interested. Don, same kind of question. Uh, you are uh, the the uh, end user here on this. Um, you look at stuff like this, and, and does it make you feel better or worse, or is it just like, eh, it, it, no big deal, you know, we'll still use Scenario, uh, or we may or may not, because they're owned by Rico? I, I mean, it's it's going to be interesting to see how it plays out, just like the other two have said. Uh, I do want to take a little bit of exception to something Derek said that we've seen this before. Yes, in the past few years, we've seen a glut of acquisitions, but they've mainly been like venture capital to integrator or venture capital to manufacturer or manufacturer to manufacturer. And we haven't really seen, to my knowledge, an, a manufacturer buying a fairly large integrator. I mean, Scenario made the list of top however many in one of the magazines the past few years. I personally have experience with them. They're fantastic integrator, but the it, it, it like the purchases of you know all of Derek's competitor from Harmon years ago, you know, or some of the other purchases uh, that company's purchase of SVSI, you know, those sorts of things. They're buying a piece of the company. They're not buying the whole company, and that's sort of problematic as an end user. If if they're my integrator. I'm going to be concerned that their parent company doesn't care about their general integration. They only care about this little pocket of UCC that they're interested in purchasing. So I would want to see how it plays out before I would go with them again. But, and again, I mentioned to you guys before we even started recording, in my mind, Rico is still a copier company and, and that alone kind of scares me with them purchasing in the AV space. Um, you know, it, It'll be interesting to watch. I'll put it that way. So, so let me wrap up here, and, and and any of the three of you can can comment, or we can just move on to the next one. My my, my the way that I've been reading this, and, and again, I've I've watched Rico the last couple of years. Um, they have developed a UCC as a service, and they did purchase Data Vision. My my understanding is is it's not been sunshine and roses uh, in the EU. Um, but that's kind of what I'm looking at here is, is scenario, like, like Don said, SCN top 50, right? Uh, so not, not exactly a small integrator, but what maybe it's possible that they're just looking for a, an army of people. They're looking for the folks to go out and deploy what they already sell, right? If you're doing UCC as a service, well, then you need, you need techs, you need bodies, you need engineers, you, and, and quite frankly, you need salespeople uh, to sell that. Um, so, you know, that's kind of what I'm seeing. Maybe that's what this is going into is, is they're looking for a deployment arm, uh, and it happens to be scenario, scenario in this instance. Well, and that's what really scares me because I don't know the reputation of a data path or data. Who did you say in, in the EU? Data the, vision. The, data vision. I don't know what their reputation was in the EU. So I don't know if they were known as a really great integrator or a, you know, middle of the road integrator or a terrible integrator, but I know that here, Scenario, at least on the East Coast, has a really good reputation. I have yeah. not heard any bad things about them. I've worked with them. I mean, they're a fantastic integrator. And I think it would be a crying shame to have them watered down to just a deployment arm for a particular niche product, as opposed to being an integrator full service that could handle things that my company needs and other companies in the area need. So. It, 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 that that is my opinion, right? Uh, I, that is not what they have done to date with Data Vision. They they have certainly they've still continued to sell. They've still continued to integrate other companies and other other products. 
Um, but it, to, to me, it, it, an investment like this means that it, it, some way, shape, or form, eventually, you know, um, that, that that's the direction they may be heading. Yeah, I think it's a, I think that's a valid point, Tim. I, you know, I think it's something to actually watch because, you know, the number one thing everybody, you know, outside of equipment can't find is people. Um, and so if you got a specialized service and, and there's competitors or, you know, even, you know, manufacturers, it's a very, you know, it, that could be a very smart move by them to do, knowing that they're not complete experts in what they're trying to grow and sell in that particular vertical. And so they went out and found somebody that, with the reputation of what Don stated, could be a very good partner in helping them grow in that service. And so, you know, I think from that perspective, that could be a trend that a lot of companies may have to look at in those boardrooms and say, we can grow, we need to grow. Let's get creative here in terms of how we do it, you know, so very interesting point. I think that, that's a good point, too. And that's going to drive some of the M&As that happen in 23, in, in mid to late 23, especially as uh, the chip shortage kind of wanes um, and we start getting product again in, in waves, right? Not in, you know, ones and twos, but when, when everybody starts getting back up to, to capacity again. Um, next story comes to us from our website, avianation.tv. PPDS is now certified for use by the U.S. government as part of continued investment expansion and ambitious growth strategy in North America. Uh, TAA compliance, which stands for Trade Act Agreement Compliance, now permits the procurement of Phillips professional displays for federal, state, and local government institutional projects. Mr. Jonkus, as our uh, as our manufacturer on this panel, how important not only is TAA, uh, I'll have you comment on that, but how important is TAA, is JITC, are the other government certifications and authorizations for manufacturers, but also uh, for folks who, who may not care or need um, that level of security, that level of, um, uh, of uh, compliance, but maybe benefit from it? Well, yeah, we look at these compliance programs as things that as a manufacturer at Extron that we need to, you know, find ways to um, see how we can accommodate them if that's who you'd like to do business with. And so when it comes to governmental entities uh, worldwide or any of their contractors um, or people that associate and work with them, they also need to fall under those levels of compliance as well. So it could be just as simple as the way you communicate and like the tools that you would use. Like for example, maybe you need to use a certain uh, type of uh, operating system or Windows software, for example, if you wanna perform transactions. And it goes all the way out to the way that the products work. Unfortunately at Extron, um, those levels of compliance, whether it's TAA or whether it's uh, made in the USA kind of standards, um, those are the things that we actually do and can accommodate pretty easily um, for nearly all of our product line. And I believe that's one of the reasons why um, among the factors that, you know, we get chosen to be able to work on those projects is because as customers are looking to make assessments of, you know, the technical credibility of products and also, you know, where they're made and how they're compliant according to the standards they set, you know, they're free to make those choices. Um, but there's certainly a lot of them. I'm sure Don can speak to a whole bunch. She, she is up next and she is right there in the beltway. So Don, I know for you, right? And, and, and we make a joke. There's a reason that we can't say where she works. Um, but for you, certainly uh, this, the TAA and GITC is, is, is important. Explain to people why though. So first, let me just say, I was so excited when this story broke this week that I immediately sent out an email to my entire team and said, holy cow, look, because this is great news for us. Um, I, you know, I work for a very large company in that vertical. I don't work on a program. I don't work on a particular government customer, but I work internally designing the AV rooms and the conference rooms and the, and the places and spaces that my company does business with those government entities. Yeah. And as such, some of those spaces are free and open, just like any old classroom or, or, or conference room in a, in a public sector company. And some of them are as high security as full skiffs with all the places. I mean, so high in security, I can't go into them with what levels I have. So you know, you never know who's going to be in those meetings, what they're going to be talking about, and who might be trying to listen in. 
And so having the availability of these tools that meet the government standards, TAA, JIDIC, um, the Air Force standards, the, the, the cleared devices standards and, and wireless, you know, or wireless free certifications, those sorts of things are vital and they're my bread and butter. Um, one of the efforts we're trying to do within my corporation is standardize a lot of our AV equipment mm. as part of that standardization effort. You know, right now, every site and every building buys their own stuff and it may or may not be the right stuff. And in giving them direction and saying, no, these are the standards you need to buy with, we're trying to standardize on TAA approved equipment, even on the open spaces, because with a company of our size and the way they move staff around and buy other companies or sell off, spin off divisions of the company, you never know who's going to be where from week to week, month to month, year to year. And in a lot of cases, if we don't have a huge giant capital budget of AV, and let me tell you, the AV budget for the entire enterprise is a rounding error to this company, but that's all they give us. You know, <laughs> we have to make do with what we have. And if we can redeploy equipment from a site that's closed or being re shuffled and deploy that into a different space that might be closed, that's a cost savings and a time savings and a stress savings for me and for my team. And that is huge. So the fact that we have yet another display manufacturer that we can put on our magic approved list delights me to no end. They, they, they were put on already. I think the day that that email came out and I sent it off, I was like, let's start working on getting our letters and certificates of volatility and to get the official blessing because mm -hmm. that's, I, I'm excited. So, but that's why it's important. You never know. We, you know, we, we are a moving industry. We're growing and changing and essential industry. So or vertical, I should say. So we're the ones that that need this flexibility. And if you can provide that as an integrator or a manufacturer, we love you. All right. Ace, last, you have the last word on this one. You know, how important are certifications and, and requirements like this? Uh, I think in the integration space, very. Um, it's always interesting um, when they come into a live environment and they have to leave their safe haven and they're going in you know, open network ho hotels and plugging into whatever, how, you know, those restrictions kind of lie down a little bit and they're not as uptight, but we saw more of that uh, carry over uh, in the virtual space, right? When everybody uh, had to not meet in their offices, but now meet in the virtual environment of different platforms and other services out there. And, and, and that's where the uh, event platforms quickly learned about, you know, securities and what's required by these organizations because they're not typically used to that conversation when they're dealing in the live event space and streaming from there versus, you know, streaming from corporate offices and, and things like that. So it was definitely an eye opener to the live event side of the industry and the word security and all the things that come with it. But um, it is definitely a different perspective from the live side versus when they're in their home turf and in their offices and securing their data and information and tools and networks and systems. And Ace, if I could just jump in real quick and say, in, in the case of my company, when we do a live event at a hotel or someplace like that, we'll use the folks they tell us to, but in some cases, we'll bring our own stuff <laughs> and, and just say, you can set up using this. <laughs> it doesn't yep, go in your walls. Yep. Use this. Right. So... It's always been there. You just might not have had to have hands on it. <laughs> no, no. And I think we'll get back to that. No, a lot of companies, especially uh, major secure companies, will come in and set up their own networks. Mm -hmm. You know, you give we me this that. company, I'm setting up my own VLAN and you get out my way. Um, yep. So it, we'll definitely get back to that as folks are re-entering ballroom spaces and convention centers. So definitely seen it and been part of it, Don. So I know where you're coming from. <laughs> uh, all right. Last one here uh, comes to us from our friends over at SCN and AV Network. Uh, John Userfer, uh, John Marshall, CEO for Userful, uh, try to combine that for a second here, <laughs> has a solution to the AV industry supply chain. He calls it a debacle. I'll just call it, you know, a bump in the road over the course of our career. He says the answer is software centric solutions, quote unquote, proprietary AV hardware supply chain delays are not a short term problem. Some say it will be five years or more until the semiconductor shortage is solved. This does not mean that AV business has to stop or even slow down. Uh, Mr. Marshall goes on to say that the solution here is software-based AV solutions. Don, I'm going to give you the first word on this. What do we think of Mr. Marshall's um, pontificating? 
I 100% agree and disagree with him. <laughs> All right, gentlemen, I... this is where we sit back and relax because Dawn will take the rest of the show. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, <laughs> sorry. Um, but no, no, no he... I think it's fantastic. I love when you do this. Go. He makes a fantastic point. I mean, the chip shortage is not going away. It existed before the COVID pandemic. It was starting to make waves in our industry even before all the supply chain collapse and pandemic issues came up. It'll be here for a while afterwards because they're so far behind now. So if you are a company that's out there, integrator or manufacturer, that's just planning on using gray boxes, you know me and my gray boxes, nobody cares about them, guys. You're going to have a problem if that's the way you're thinking. So software-defined solutions to a lot of issues within AV are a major solution. In fact, right now we're piloting a program at my company. I can't say too much more, but we're doing our first 50-room deployment of a software-based solution for management, control, monitoring, the whole schmear, you know, that replaces, sorry guys, a hell of a lot of black boxes that we would have otherwise purchased from folks that may or may not be on this call or may or may not be a year behind in delivering things. So, you know, <laughs> it, it, it's a really practical solution. However, that's the part I 100% agree with. Okay. But at the end of the day, you can't do everything with software. I've said this for years, how important the AV industry is. If everything was software and computers, that'd be great. But without a display, you can't access any of that data, any of that software, any of that info. At the end of the day, your ears and your eyes, the analog parts of our industry still exist. You still need to feed the info into your ears, feed the vision, the, the images into your eyes. And so some parts of the industry, you can't have a software solution for a display on the wall. You can't have a software solution for a camera to record the information in the space. So certain things, yes, this is 100% the greatest solution. And people should be looking at that already if they're, if they're not already, because a lot of your end users are. But it's not going to replace everything. It is not the be-all, end-all magic solution that, that the article tends to paint it as. Um, there will always be need for chips. There will always be need for some hardware. There may always be need for some gray boxes. Don't get me wrong, guys. But if we can do it with software in a secure way on a secure network or a secure VLAN, that's the way we can go for the interim or for the long haul. That wasn't All too right. long, Tim. <laughs> no, no. Uh, Ace, uh, you know, where, where do we, where, do we, where does this sit with you? Not only in, in the live event space, but also, you know, uh, from, from your, your integration, uh, view as well. Um, from the integration view, I would say, I, I feel like we were already headed in that direction. Um, you know, the shortage is now just accelerating, you know, the effort to get there faster. Um, but it's not anything new or anything that didn't exist prior to uh, you know the, the, the short the greater short shortage that we're seeing now as Don put there was a shortage already happening pre-covid so we're just now realizing how bad it really gotten and now you know having the, the search and scour for options and you know much like probably folks on the live event side you know I think integrators were looking into networking you know prior to all of this but the live event space, I would say 80% of the industry never heard of NDI until, you know, probably June of 2020. <laughs> and, and now it's, you know, their favorite toy in the toolbox and, you know, tools like Wirecast, VMix and OBS literally saved companies for, you know, a year to introduce them to solutions of doing things via software and IP um, globally um, versus their traditional approach to executing um event so you know yes it is a solution it's not a end-all be-all because it's still software right so somebody's got to write code and somebody's got to do an update and god knows what that update is going to do so software still scares the hell out of most people um which is why they're so tentative to you know dive into it fully into a system but you know eventually that's where things are evolving too and more and more devices will be replaced with software but um it's a i won't call it a band-aid because i think it's more than that right now um you know than what it was a few years ago because it's improved right we've had updates it's crashed it's gotten better so um it, it it's 
more than a Band-Aid now. <laughs> Let's put it's, it that way. It's a durable medical device. <laughs> and there we go. <laughs> Interesting. Okay, durable medical device. Uh, Eric, <laughs> you'll, you'll have the last word on this. As, as a manufacturer of, of gray boxes, um, you guys have also moved to software, right? You've got virtual control now. Not the only one on the market that has, that has virtual control. So talk for a second about this, this idea here, um, the move to software. Um, and, and the move to um, designing and, and implementing with software. Yeah, I, I would say there probably isn't a product that we make or think about or look to conceive that, that doesn't involve some software at Extron. In fact, I think uh, one of the areas of largest areas of investment over time, even if you look at our open positions right now, there's all kinds of positions that are really, we're looking for more talent in that area. Um, you know, there's kind of this saying that I, a colleague of mine talks about that the new the new quality, the measure for that is convenience. And uh, right. So the good enough sometimes is actually good enough. And I think that there's a place where a lot of these things fit together. You know, there are some high performing applications where at least right now, some of the software solutions may not be the best fit because there is a certain expectation of quality. There's a certain element of latency that needs to be overcome. And that could be with live events, but that can also be as something, something as simple as a small discussion like we're having here today. So I think there are so many different layers to our industry now that there's more than enough space to fit different types of technologies. And I think that probably the larger challenge is really making sure that, you know, as professionals in our, in our craft, that we're able to really define for our customers, the people that would use the things that, that you know, any of us, even on our, in our uh, kind of, even in this discussion today, um, that you're really having that really intelligent conversation. So you're really setting expectations about, you know, what levels of service will get you, what levels of result, you know, it could be, if you're an esports application, for example, maybe that's not a very great place to have latency because the whole idea of the fundamental of the competition is to make that as near real time as possible. But sometimes good enough is good enough. And, you know, if if AC are working in an, in an application where you need to send some part of your feed to somewhere else, but so long as it gets there, it's okay, but it's not nearly, it doesn't happen in real time, that might be okay. And Don, I would imagine there are applications where you have where hey, I need to make sure these systems are switching in the right way, that things are being communicated in the right way because status is the most important element. So I guess as a manufacturer, you know, we have to consider those items and choose you know, in what technologies do we want to invest and you know, when is the right time to bring those to market. And um, you know, we, we get the benefit of everyone's feedback. I mean, a lot of what we do is driven by feedback, but yeah, I think there's a place for software-based solutions, and I, I don't think they're going away. I think they're they're here permanently in one form or another. It's just, just to see how that goes. We will indeed. All right, y'all. Thanks so much. Uh, Dawn Mead. Thank you, ma'am. How do people connect with you? Well, I can't tell you where I work, but I can tell you you can always find me on the social networks at AV Dawn or Dawn Mead if you're boring and want to go to LinkedIn. <laughs> but um... If you're boring. I love that. <laughs> You can also find me occasionally teaching at Evixa or teaching, uh, you know, around um, doing presentations, hanging out with people, being cool and groovy. And of course, you can find me here on avnation.tv on AV Week as often as Tim will let me come on and on AV Social whenever I get around to recording one. <laughs> We've been trying to schedule one for months. That's fairly it's, it's, accurate, guys. Yeah, I mean, just, right? You know. <laughs> Yeah, that's fairly that accurate. That's pure entertainment. Okay, that's it was pure 100%. entertainment. Right. Uh, Ace, always good to see you, brother. Uh, how do people connect with you and uh, hire your services if they call you early enough because you're booked through 25, but hey. <laughs> I'm coming out of my cave, um, so I'm doing this podcast and, you know, I'm going to get back out in the world, you know, so I'll check my Twitter. You can follow me at Wallace, uh, no, at Wallace CTS. Um, if you want to find, uh, get me, email me, uh, ace at dxg.agency, uh, dxg.agency, uh, is the website and, uh, yeah, I'll be around. All right. Mr. Jonkus, always good to see you, sir. Uh, how do people connect with you or Extron Electronics? Uh, you can connect with me or with the company at, at extron.com anywhere in the world, or, um, you can find me on LinkedIn. Thanks for having okay. me, Tim, and your conversation today. Absolutely. 
Uh, for me, for Tim Albright, do not follow me on the Twitters um, because by the time you listen to this, uh, I, the Bears will either be 2-0 and o or 1-1. and one. It depends on how much it rains on this <laughs> Sunday. And that is an inside joke. And if you don't know what it is, look up the Bears versus the Niners game from last week, and it was rather entertaining. Um, but go to the website, if you would, please, avianation.tv. It's avianation.tv. You will find this program and a host of others. Dawn's uh, aforementioned uh, infrequent AV social. Uh, Matt's got... Um, There's a whole archive, though. Watch the old ones. I think there's a whole archive. You should go watch those. Those are fantastic. Um, uh, Matt Scott does a Resi Week, and uh, we have a daily one that our uh, incredible producer, Mitchell Tulin, does called The Daily Download, uh, and a host of others, so check those out as well. Uh, also, we're going to Cedia. We'll be in Dallas the 29th of September through the 1st of October, so uh, check out those as well. All that and more at avianation.tv. That's avianation.tv. Thanks so much for listening. Thank you so much for watching. That is all the time we have for AV Week.